On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin rode atop Vostok 1 to become the first human in space and the first human in orbit. This was, of course, the pivotal moment in spaceflight, but also the most pivotal moment in human history, with only the heavier-than-air flight being comparable in its global reach. It came three and a half years after the Soviet Union put the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, into space, three weeks before the United States would put Alan Shepard into space, and 10 months before John Glenn became the first American and third person in orbit. The second person in orbit was Herman Titov, who was considered a stronger candidate than Gagarin, but for that reason, it was decided to reserve him for Vostok 2, which was to be a full day mission rather than just one orbit. Let's take a quick look at the vehicle that would bring Gagarin into space and some of the cosmonaut training. Here you see the capsules being prepared. There were six Vostok missions, crewed Vostok missions in total. I'm not clear on the original source for this video, but I assume it was recorded by the Soviet government and it's not the property of the Russian government. Here the capsule is being matched up with the equipment module that will also make the descent burn that will be necessary to bring Garen back. They had to practice cosmonaut rescue procedures, though as it turned out I don't think Garen ended up that close to his capsule, as we will soon see. And of course for the Russian missions, that rescue and recovery happened on land. Here we have the cosmonauts getting technical briefings, and uh, eventually they will also get their look at the R-7 drive rocket that would take them into space. We'll talk a bit more about the R-7 family on the way up. Of course, uh, the R-7 spawned an entire family of rockets that are still in use. Otherwise, I'm sure cosmonaut preparation in this early phase of spaceflight was more or less what we'd expect it to be. Humans had not been to space, so there was no one to inform us what training would be useful. Uh, what everyone, Russians and Americans alike, knew with certainty was that there would be high G-forces involved, and so training for that was definitely prioritized. And don't forget, preparing to eject from the capsule, that's important. Here we see footage of what is hopefully Gagarin's rocket being prepared. Uh, unfortunately, it's not 100% clear to me that other footage hasn't been spliced in of other rockets just for dramatic effect, but I assume this is the Vostok K that took Gagarin up. And of course, it's a testament to the longevity of this design that it looks a lot like the preparation of a Soyuz rocket today, and so a certainly successful family of rockets here. Uh, at least there's no mistaking Gagarin himself with that distinctive smile. Gagarin was 27 at this point, and while undoubtedly nervous, maintained the cheerful composure that he would later display to the world as a global celebrity. Gagarin entered the rocket two hours before launch, uh, early in the morning on April 12th, and uh, his heart rate as he waited in the capsule for those two hours was at around 64 beats per minute, according to records. This was in sharp contrast to the designer of the rocket and the genius behind the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev, who had to take a pill to calm his heart. And we'll see him in a moment here as we get ready for the launch. And with that, let's go. Gagarin was on his way. I don't have any more of the original audio, so I'll read from a translation from RussianSpaceWeb.com on the way up. Early on, Gagarin reported, Noise in the cabin can be heard little. Everything is going well. Condition is good. Mood is upbeat. Everything is good. Early on, he was mostly communicating with Korolev himself. The Vostok provided a relatively smooth ride up to orbit, taking 11 minutes with moderate G-forces compared to the 5 minutes and extremely high G-forces for the American Mercury Atlas system. As of this recording, the R-7 family of launchers, which include the original R-7 ICBM, this launcher, the Vostok, and uh, subsequent developments like the Molnia and, of course, Soyuz, have made 1,749 launches, 1,636 successes, and 113 failures, most of those early on, for a total success rate of 93.5%. There is something to be said for not completely abandoning a design that works.
about a minute into flight and close to max Q, maximum dynamic pressure, Gagarin reports vibration getting more frequent, noise increasing somewhat. As the first stage proceeds, the G-forces build and he sneaks in that between assurances saying, feeling great, continuing flight, loads increase, everything is good. After giving his best wishes to Gagarin, Korolov mainly calls out the elapsed time, but after calling out 100 for 100 seconds, with uh, G-forces reaching their peak, he asks, how are you feeling? Uh, Gagarin responds, feeling good, how are you? Uh, the how are you probably means how is the flight going from down there. Korolev assures him that the launch is on track and the vehicle is going well. Here we're coming up on booster separation, 118 seconds in, the boosters complete their work and separate in the distinctive Korolev cross, which you see there, and so they flip out like that, and that can be seen from the ground as they still have a little bit of residual flare left to them. That unique staging, of course, named after the chief designer Sergei Korolev, and one of the aspects that's unique is the tapered core stage that you see there, which allows the boosters to fit more snugly into the body. On the booster separation, Gagarin's communications couldn't be heard on the ground, but the onboard tape caught him saying, the first stage has completed its work, loads and vibration has subsided, the flight continuing well, receiving, I'm hearing you well, the separation was felt, the second stage is firing, everything is good, receiving. This is only the start of a lot of communication problems faced by Gagarin, as we'll soon see. The fairing was discarded earlier than I chose to do in the simulation, so around here Gagarin started remarking on the beauty of the clouds and the landscape, which weren't entirely clear, even though the fairing has a little gap for the capsule, uh, it was obscured until the fairing separated. Four minutes in, he also reports a slow rotation, and I can report after trying to launch this thing that the vernier rockets used to control the rocket aren't particularly good at managing anything but pitch. That's especially true after the boosters separate. We are approaching the conclusion of the core stage here, and after five minutes, Gagarin reported that the core stage has shut down. And so there we see the separation of the core stage. And I believe uh, here is where I chose to separate the fairings. So there we have it. The little spacecraft is now continuing on its way with the upper stage rocket burning for a further six minutes. After ignition of the upper stage, Gagarin reported, Hear you perfectly, feeling perfect, the flight is going well. Observing Earth, visibility is good. It is possible to distinguish everything. And uh, what you get from the transcript is the general sense that even before reaching orbit he was captivated by the sight of everything out the window and of course that is perfectly natural. The rest of the communication through launch was entirely routine. Complicating matters was the fact that the flight controllers really wouldn't know if Gagarin had reached the intended orbit for quite some time. 13 minutes after launch Korolev knew that uh, Gagarin had made orbit but didn't know what kind of orbit. The intended orbit was 230 by 169 kilometers, which is low enough that Gagarin would re-enter within 10 days even if the retrofire failed. Uh, of course, the equipment module attached to the sphere there, as we'll soon see here with the upper stage detaching. Uh, the equipment module has the retrofire rockets, and so they need to work to bring him down, especially in this case because he did not reach the intended orbit, in fact, uh, Gagarin was in a 327 by 169 kilometer orbit, meaning that without the successful retrofire, he would not be brought back down before his life support ran out. Now, in the simulation here, I ran into a completely different problem in that my decoupler uh, remained attached to my equipment module in a little bit of a problem that I still haven't figured out the solution to. And so, what it means is actually my retrofire rockets aren't going to work. Don't worry, I figured out a, a little cheaty way to bring the, the Kerbal doing the simulation back down, but that's just a side note. Anyway, the different orbit also meant that the timer for the retrofire engine was off for the deorbit maneuver, and so it would be done earlier than it was intended, and Gagarin would land short of his target. It's not clear when Mission Control figured all this out, but in any case, no one was willing to tell Gagarin. First of all, he had a great deal of trouble making communication at all during this flight, and when he attempted to ask how his orbit was, 
Ground stations would rebuff him, saying they didn't have instructions from Korolev to tell him anything. Uh, here's my fruitless attempt to make a retro fire. Now, while my decoupler didn't detach properly, in the real mission for Gagarin, uh, the general story is that the equipment module failed to separate properly from the capsule until uh, re-entry began, and at that point, the, the equipment module snapped off. But here you see that uh, I have finished my uh, full retro burn, but I, I, bring, I bring the Kerbal back into the proper orbit and separate the equipment module. In my case, it separated perfectly successfully. That was the least of my problems. As we make our way back down here, I'll offer up the classic exchange that occurred 19 minutes in between Gagarin and the Kamchatka uh, Zarya 3 station. Uh, Gagarin reports that everything is going well and asks, what can you tell me? Zarya 3 just says, hear you well, instruments working well, feeling well. Gagarin responds, hear you perfectly, what can you tell me about the flight, what can you tell me? Zarya 3 tells him, instructions from the 20th, that's Korolev, have not been received, the flight is going well. Gagarin says, understood, there were no instructions from the 20th, report your data about the flight. Say hello to Blondie. Blondie, I believe, is uh, Alexei Leonov, who would conduct a first spacewalk, and he was stationed at Kamchatka at the time. Zarya 3 says, how do you hear me? Gagarin says, hearing you well, and you? Zarya 3, how are you feeling? Gagarin says, I am feeling outstanding, perfect, perfect, perfect. Tell me the results on the flight. Zarya 3 says, repeat, can't hear well. So basically the ground station played the I can't hear you, there's too much static game. And after that, Gagarin was headed southeast across the Pacific with no communication. He rounded the Strait of Magellan south of South America. And here we see after the retro burn at the west coast of Africa, he made his descent across uh, parts of Northern Africa and then into the Soviet Union. Gagarin faced between 8 to 10 G's on descent and a lot of tumbling, and that wasn't the end of his rough ride because in order to survive he actually had to eject from the capsule, otherwise uh, the impact would have not been good for him, and so he had to parachute down as I have uh, this, this little Kerbal doing. As mentioned, Gagarin landed short of his target because of the higher orbit, and he was about 300 kilometers southwest of his intended landing spot. And so he had to find help because obviously those rescue crews who were, who were preparing uh, were nowhere near there. And so he had a long trip, and he asked for help from some locals, and the capsule was recovered uh, separately. It had parachuted down and left a minor crater in the ground there. And it was reported here is Korolev inspecting the results of that, the remains of the capsule, and that was brought back to base. And so Yuri Gagarin goes down in history as the first global hero and adventurer with the entire world, even the Soviet Union's adversaries in the Cold War, immediately recognizing the accomplishment for what it was. Certainly, if the promise of humans in space that his flight set in motion yields the necessary future of human beings among the stars, the name Gagarin will never be forgotten. That said, this was only the first step and we have a, a long road ahead of us. Thank you for watching April 12th in Space History, Yuri Gagarin on Vostok 1. Special thanks to YouTubers SpaceVids.TV and Eureka for footage, Raider Nick for the rocket, Space Factory for the spacecraft, and RussianSpaceWeb.com for a complete timeline.